so thank you everyone for joining. So now I would like to hand over the call to Mamta Mataji uh, for the next uh, uh, thing. So Mamta Mataji, please take over. Hare Krishna Mataji, Dandvat Pranam, Guru Sushila Prabhupada and Shila Gurudev. We will read the verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, Chapter 29, Verse Number 5. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. It's on the screen, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Oh, sorry, Mataji. I was on mute. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Buddhim tu pramadam vidyan Mahamam iti yat kritam Yam adishthaya dehe smin Oman bhung tekshabhir gunan Translation The great sage Narada continued The word pramada mentioned in this regard to the material intelligence or ignorance. It is to be understood as such when one takes shelter of this kind of intelligence he identifies himself with the material body, influenced by the material consciousness of I and mine. He begins to enjoy and suffer through his senses. Thus the living entity is entrapped, purpured by Srila Prabhupada. In material existence, so-called intelligence is actually ignorance. When intelligence is cleared up, it is called buddhi yoga. In other words, when intelligence is dovetailed toward Dovetailed with the desire of Krishna, it is called Buddhi Yoga or Bhakti Yoga. Therefore, in Bhagavad Gita 10.10, 10, 10, 10, Krishna says, Te sham satata yukta nam rajatam priti purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam yena maam upayanti te. To those who are constantly dovetailed and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. Real intelligence means linking with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When this is done, the Supreme Personality of Godhead from within gives one the real intelligence by which one can return home back to Godhead. Intelligence in the material world is described in this verse as Pramada, Pramada because in material existence, the living entity falsely claims things to be his. He thinks, I am the monarch of all I survey. This is ignorance. Actually, nothing belongs to him. Even the body and the senses do not belong to him, for they are given to him by the grace of the Lord to satisfy his different propensities through the material energy. Nothing actually belongs to the living entity, but he becomes mad after everything, claiming, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine. Janasya maho yam aham mamiti. This is called illusion. Nothing belongs to the living entity, but he claims that everything belongs to him. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu recommends that this false intelligence be purified. Cheto Darpanam Arjanam. When the mirror of intelligence is polished, the real activities of the living entity begin. This means that when a person comes to the platform of Krishna consciousness, his real intelligence acts. At that time, he knows that everything belongs to Krishna and nothing belongs to him. As long as one thinks that everything belongs to him, he is in material consciousness. And when he knows perfectly that everything belongs to Krishna, he is in Krishna consciousness. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna. I, do you see Maharaj join? Do you see Maharaj is join or not? No, Mataji, he's not there. Yeah, 
Let me call him up, G. Uh, Hare Krishna Mataji, we can continue chanting because Maharaj is uh, joining very shortly. Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Maharaj has joined Mataji. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Welcome to the conference call, Prabhu Maharaj. <laughs> The verse, Maharaj, you can start the uh, 4.29.4. Should I read the verse? Uh, we already did, Maharaj. Everything? Yeah. Oh. Well, I'll have to look at it before I can say anything because I'm just looking at it. I uh, can't get on before one thirty, but for before uh, at seven, I can't get on before seven thirty your time because of puja I do for the deities. That's why I'm always late. Yeah, no problem, Maharaj. We were waiting. Mm -hmm. So the word pramana is mentioned in this card to material intelligence. So uh, material intelligence traps one into the concept of I and mine. And then, but then Prabhupada explains what is actually real intelligence and how intelligence is needed in order to practice Krishna consciousness. So uh, Krishna says, Om Agyan Tumarandasya Gena Jana Salakaya. Chaksu Undali Kamyena Tasmai Shri Guru Vena Maha Shri Shaitanya Vinobi Stan Stati Kamyena Utale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Dadati Kam Mount Vishnu Padai Krishna Prestai Utale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tilamane 
Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Putarine Nirvishesha Sunivari Pastyatya Dei Sutarine Panchakopa Tarupascha Kripa Sindhu Peva Cha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Ramaho Ramaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadakar Srivasana Gaur Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama, Hare Hare. Sometimes we use the word use your intelligence. That means use your ability to understand and to explain. So intelligence is made up of many factors. The two outstanding factors is discrimination and determination. These are the two main factors. So discrimination. So then again, what is intelligence and where does it lie? It lies in the subtle body. Intelligence cannot be seen, but it can be understood by its symptoms. It's like one cannot see the mind, but one can understand that because a person is acting and speaking, reacting, they have a mind, and the mind is working. The intelligence is a feature of the mind, but a little bit of a more subtle aspect of the mind. And Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhumir Apanalo Bayu, Kamano Buddha, Buddhyevacha, Ahankar Ityame. Bina Prakriti Astada, earth, water, fire, air, mind, intelligence, and false ego. Altogether, these eight elements make up my separated material energy. So the, the feature of the material energy is comprised of three and five, or five and three. So five gross elements and three subtle elements. So the cell of elements that are mind, intelligence, and the sense of self. So the intelligence is a special feature of the living entity. Now intelligence uh, is the natural position of the soul's relationship with Krishna. In other words, um, the soul also has intelligence and has purified intelligence or what we say spiritual intelligence. And, uh, but that spiritual intelligence is covered over by a layer of material energy. So it comes through the material energy and feed and acts based on that material energy and therefore it's called material. And Prabhupada here calls the material intelligence ignorance. Yeah. It's ignorance because it doesn't really bring you to what is the proper understanding of one's, you know, goal in life. Mm -hmm. Intelligence is meant to discriminate between what is, what is favorable and what is unfavorable. On the material platform, intelligence is again the savior of the living entity. And also on the spiritual platform, it's the feature that elevates the material and the spiritual entity back to the spiritual world. So one has to have what they say, good intelligence here, or spiritual intelligence. And probably the word booty, booty means intelligence. And when it's connected to, uh, to Krishna, it's called booty yoga. And Prabhupada quotes this verse from the Bhagavad Gita 10.10, Tesham Satata Yuktanam, Bajitam priti purvakam, dadami buddhi yogam tam yena mamupiyantite. So one uses their intelligence to constantly engage in devotional service, and that attracts Krishna. Mm -hmm. And that attracting principle causes Krishna to guide that person through the intelligence back to him in loving devotional service. So out of all the principles of existence that the material that the living entity is equipped with, 
intelligence is our, our friend, or it could also be our enemy, just like it says that also, that the mind is also the friend and the enemy. But the intelligence is the one that, that guides the mind. Without proper gu mental guidance, then the, the mind will act according to thinking, feeling, and willing. So the mind loses, doesn't have a discriminating factor to it. And therefore the intelligence is required to discriminate. Um, discriminating factor of the mind is what I like and what I don't like, or what I need or what I don't need. But that necessarily doesn't bring one to the platform of success because what I like and what I don't like and what I need and don't need is all material. And ultimately, one that is always changing based on one's, uh, what we say, interaction with the material energy. In other words, what I like and don't like can change from day to day. Same with one's needs. But the intelligence is really a great feature of the, uh, the uh, living entity. It's a blessing from God because it can help us bring that material mind to the spiritual platform. But if the material, but the, the intelligence is like the mind, then you have two enemies, not only the mind, but also the intelligence that guides the one in the wrong direction. But here, when intelligence is used to serve the, the Lord, then that intelligence uh, attracts the mercy of the Lord in such a way that the Lord brings the living entity back to him in loving devotion and service. Prabhupada gives you one little bit of an explanation of how to change your material intelligence to spiritual intelligence. And one of that features is to understand the difference between matter and spirit. And that difference is understood in this particular uh, purport as that which it belongs to me and that which does not belong to me. So what belongs to me? Well, me means the soul. Well, the, because the soul is by nature spirit, everything we perceive in this world is being given to us. Nothing that we have in this world is acquired by us. It's all being given through, either by Krishna directly or by Krishna through the external energy. So whatever we have, or whatever we can also experience, is coming from other sources. So Prabhupada makes that point, nothing belongs to me. But the conditioned soul, he looks and he says, I like this, therefore I should get this. Now it's mine. Um, so in the, uh, this idea of mine, is simply a part of the uh, bodily concept of life. Janasa moham, jasa moho, aham mameti. <coughs> moho means illusion. Aham mameti, I and mine. So in the material world, there's two conceptions of illusion based on the body. One is the I principle, and one is the mind principle. The I principle is more prominent in the human species, whereas the mind principle is more prominent in the animal species. But even in the human species, the mind principle is very strong, at least as we acquire more and more material things in relationship to our activities, then we find that this mind principle becomes more and more strong. So the mind principle is, you know, this is mine. And we also refer to that in relationship to other living at this is my husband. Uh, this is my children. This is my wife. This is my, you know, automobile. This is my uh, electronic device. You know, this, the list goes on. But one can sometimes relinquish the mind principle based on loss and gain, when one loses something, 
that mind principle is lost to some degree. And of course, when one gains something, then the mind principle becomes stronger. But the I principle is more stronger in the living entity in the sense that one identifies with oneself in a certain way. I am Indian. I am an American. I am Chinese. I am a resident of the United States of America. I am young. I am old. So this I principle you see is more prominent in the features. So, but both are all based on a wrong conception, which is I am this body. So as long as that concept of I am this body remains the feature of identity, then the I and mind principle expands itself out into different areas. And that is illusion. And that causes one to think and act in their own way. Uh, everything is coming from another source. We understand that Krishna says, aham bija, aham pita bada bija, aham bija ata pita. I am the seed giving and living, I am the seed giving father of all living entities. Aham sarvasya prabhavo, mata sarvam prabhartante, iti vajam majante mam buddha bhava samanvitamha. Krishna says, I am the source of all material and spiritual worlds. Everything emanates from me. The wise who know this engage in my devotional service and worship me with all their hearts. So Krishna makes this point. It's one of the more prominent verses in the Bhagavad Gita from the 10th chapter where Krishna says, everything in existence is coming from me, both material and spiritual. So we understand that one who creates something, they also own it. So Krishna, everything belongs to the Supreme Lord. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhaktaram Yagya Tapasam Sarvaloka Maheshwaram Suhidam Sarvabhutanam Yantam Shantam Yam Mantyantam Rich to Tea. Um, I am the you know, supreme proprietor of all planets and demigods. I am the well wisher and benefactor of all living entities. I am, uh, he explains himself that he is ultimately the proprietor and the creator of everything. And he's also the benefactor of, of all of the entities. Prabhupada explains his verse, which is 529 in the Bhagavad Gita, the last verse in that chapter, as the verse for, for attaining peace. When we know that Krishna is the best friend, and everything belongs to him. You know, your friend will share things with you also. He will give you things to make you happy, to fulfill your needs. And so Krishna gives us so many things, so many relationships, but still it's coming from him. And we may use it and that's intelligence. So intelligence means to understand what is mine and what is not mine. Or even higher, what is given to me and how I can use it in the service of the Lord. So how, how do we develop intelligence? Intelligence is sharpened by hearing from purified souls or great souls. Intelligence is also sharpened by debate or controversy discussion. So when we sit down and discuss philosophical and spiritual topics, that awakens the intelligence and sharpens the intelligence because intelligence is based on discrimination. And therefore we can use discriminating powers to understand deeper what is the message of the Shastras. So therefore intelligence one of the features of bringing intelligence more to the forefront is 
as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, what is that verse? Uh, I can't remember the Sanskrit, but I remember the translation. The thoughts of my devotees dwell in me, their lives surrendered unto me, and they great, gain great satisfaction and bliss in enlightening one another and conversing about me. Much chita mat kata pranam, bodhiantas parasparam, katiantas chamam nityam tushyanticha ramanticha. That's the next verse after 10.8, which is 10.9, which is the verse for hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Yeah. So this verse is very important because it helps to sharpen the intelligence through what we say healthy discrimination through the process of hearing and discussing about Krishna. Chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra also creates a fertile intelligence where one can understand and discriminate between what is beneficial and what is not. So intelligence is really the main factor in connecting us with Krishna. And this is also confirmed by Srila Rupa Goswami in his writings, where he says that the intelligence is the bridge to the soul. Or the bridge to, is the bridge is the soul's bridge to God. So through the intelligence, the soul can connect with the Supreme Lord like that. The mind might be there, the mind might not be there. The mind is always changing and flickering. So directing the mind with purified intelligence. So what is purified intelligence? That intelligence that comes from higher authority. Just like uh, when we read Shastra, that is pure intelligence. When we hear from the great saints, we are getting pure intelligence. The words of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita is pure intelligence. So therefore, there's a principle, it's called Shastra Chakshush. It means seeing through the eye of Shastra. One has to learn to see things through what we call spiritual eyes and not these, as Prabhupada says, two round balls that are socket, that make up the sockets within our head. <laughs> um, you have to see with intelligence. You can be, the eyes can be looking at something and cannot understand what it is. But as soon as the intelligence starts to activate, then the eyes can see. So the, the eyes and all the other knowledge acquiring senses require an active intelligence in order for it to function to its, what we say, capacity. So in the same way, um, using the intelligence means to understand things clearly. <clears throat> and therefore, it's not only discriminating, it's, this, it's applying that knowledge coming from higher authorities. One time, maybe more than one time, but at least I can remember one time, Srila Prabhupada was approached by one devotee who was exhibiting some humility in front of Prabhupada. And Prabhupada was speaking and finally the boy said, well, Prabhupada, I don't have any intelligence. The boy, Prabhupada said, then go get some. What did he mean by is that get that intelligence that's coming from higher authority. So to repeat something that is correct is intelligence. Not that, that we have to create something new. That's called a misuse of intelligence. Or what we call, probably would call rascal intelligence. <clears throat> of course, we have the material intelligence. Material intelligence is a feature of the mode of passion. And what does that do? It, uh, it helps one to try to, do, to increase one's enjoyment in life. Material intelligence is always trying to help us, help the living entity enjoy the material energy more and more. So people you sharpen their intelligence in order to uh, increase their sense gratification. But for a devotee, 
Uh, intelligence is coming from guru, sadhu, and shastra, like that. And once we learn the words and be able to uh, understand, and then we can apply spiritual principles in each and every situation. Because once you understand how to use spiritual intelligence, you can not only not, you can not only understand philosophical points, but you can discriminate in, in the in the best possible way on how to execute devotional service. Because we're given so many instructions regarding devotional service. And we're not sometimes we're not really sure how to apply the instructions in each and every situation. But that comes with practice and from hearing from the spiritual master. Then the Prabhupada mentions that when the intelligence becomes fully purified, then the real activity of the soul manifests, and that is devotion and service to the Lord. So the idea is to increase one's hearing which will help to increase one's intelligence. And realizing that this material world is simply, uh, it belongs to the person who created it. Um, that's also the platform of happiness. When we know nothing belongs to us, but every, everything we have is given to us. Therefore, if we get something more, it's nice. And if we lose something, it's also nice because it's never ours in the first place and we can't keep it anyway. So when it comes and it goes, and we understand that's the nature of this world, everything just comes and goes, comes into our life and then it goes. So nothing belongs to anyone because everything is created by the Supreme Lord and therefore everything belongs to the Lord. And therefore, when it's used in the service of the Lord, the Lord becomes pleased and the devotee makes progress in devotional service. So when you know nothing belongs to you, you're happy. <laughs> but one thing does belong to you, and that is Krishna. Or I belong to Krishna. Radharani says that. She says, Mamata. Uh, Krishna's mind, Krishna's mind. Uh, she can say that. We say, uh, I belong to Krishna. <laughs> um, therefore, uh, and by devotional service, you can capture Krishna in your heart and in your life also. And when you've got Krishna, you have everything. And if you don't have Krishna, whatever you have, it's not going to bring you happiness. Okay. These are some simple points about intelligence. And of course, in the Bhagavad Gita, and I'm sorry, the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the, I think it's in the third canto, or maybe it's in this fourth canto. I'm not sure. I think it's this third canto. It talks about the intelligence. There's four symptoms of intelligence. Uh, determination, discrimination, sleep is also put into that category, and one more. In other words, when the intelligence is a, the sleep is a feature of the intelligence. When the body is rested, the mind is clear. When the mind is clear, then the intelligence is more prominent or prominent. Okay. Oh. Any questions or comments? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for uh, such a enlightening class. And, uh, so many things to learn from the class. So we thank you very much for giving available association, Maharaj, every Friday. 
so now i will request devotees if they have any questions for maharaj or they want to share any realizations so they can they go now so thank you hari krishna hari om हरे कृष्ण महाराज महाराज सो थैंक यू फॉर द वेरी एनलाइटनिंग क्लास आई हैव क्वेश्चन लाइक वी वेन वी लूज समथिंग वी कीप ऑन थिंकिंग अबाउट दैट थिंग कीप ऑन वेन एवर लाइक वी we just remember the thing whether it is a person whether it is some material thing something like that so i i uh, was thinking like you know the, when the krishna left vrindavan uh, he was so much dear to each and every one there so they were like they they like lost him they couldn't see him anymore so they were keep on thinking about krishna so how like that thing uh, will come in our life so i i want that thing to be happen like we uh, lose uh, i lost so many material thing and uh, keep on thinking about that so how should be like you know how i will be thinking about krishna all the time no matter means like you know uh, many times in bhakti riksha people say uh, in bhagavad gita we will try to explain them that krishna says think about do your duty and think about me they say how it is possible think about krishna we will think about uh, some uh, whatever thing we are doing that but uh, it's not like that i had the experience that i was keep on thinking that thing so i realized that oh this is the way i should remember krishna but that never happens well when you see everything in relationship to krishna then you understand krishna is the proprietor of everything so everything belongs to krishna so in that sense you can remember krishna when you connect anything with krishna because it all comes from him and belongs to him but if you when you see a picture of krishna you remember krishna when you see the deity you remember krishna and then you can simply think of krishna at any time and there's no rules or regulations at any time you can simply put the picture the form of krishna in your mind and then you're thinking of krishna so we have to practice that but we're surrounded by you know everything that belongs to krishna including krishna himself you can chant hari krishna any time you don't have to pick up your beads to chant you can chant while you're doing your day to day services in the house cleaning or cooking or washing yeah you can chant and then when you're chanting you're remembering krishna it's practical it depends basically if we want to remember krishna krishna will help us but we have to make some effort to make to remember krishna because the effort is needed because we have a tendency to remember everything but krishna <laughs> We'll pray to Radha Rani. She's always remembering Krishna, and she'll help you remember Krishna.
Hare Krishna. If no one has any question or comments uh, or realizations, then we can end the call here. No, Mataji devotees might have question. Please wait. Okay. Okay, sure, Mataji. Okay. Hare Krishna. Dear Maharaj, then with pranam. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and Srila Gurudev. Uh, Maharaj, thank you so much for the wonderful class and your association. Uh, there were so many nice points about mind and intelligence and how you explained that uh, Radharani says Krishna is mine and we say we belong to Krishna. I liked it so much, Maharaj. It was so beautiful. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. We can remember we belong to Krishna, then we don't have to worry about belonging to anything else. Yes. Yeah. I think, you know, I will try to keep this in my mind always. And uh, it is definitely going to help us. Thank you so much, man. Fridays yeah. are like... We're, we're, we're a visitor to this material world. This is not our home. We're just visiting. Mm -hmm. so while we're visiting, we make a little house and we get some relationships but then after some time we have to move on so um, when you realize everything in this world is temporary you take the best use of it and you use it in Christian service mm -hmm. but you have to understand that what really matters is is uh, our relationship with Krishna mm -hmm. and that we want to purify our life in such a way that we can go back home back to Godhead Mm -hmm. then nothing changes. In the spiritual world, everything is constant. In this club world, everything is always changing. Our friends change. Sometimes family members come together. Sometimes family members drift apart. And this, yes. there's a, it says like uh, when travelers are traveling around, sometimes they meet together at a particular place and they share some time together and then they go on with their travel and then they never see each other again. So that's, we're traveling, we come in contact with other living entities, we develop relationships with them, we do, we'll do our best in that relationship and then we move on. But all the time we're always moving closer to Krishna, which is that, which is that relationship, which never changes and it's always there. <laughs> Krishna is the only is the relationship that we have eternally. All the other situations we have come and go. So it doesn't mean we don't have relationships or we don't have affection in those relationships. We just have to understand that these are all temporary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the difference between what is temporary and what is eternal. We are not temporary. We live forever. Sometimes yes. we say we say that's the good news. You don't, you, you can't you can't stop living. You 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 live forever wherever. But you have to understand you can't live forever in Charlotte, North Carolina. You know, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> or Everybody. any other any other place on planet Earth. <laughs> it's all temporary. Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanavad Pranam. Thank you so much for the wonderful class. So Maharaj, uh, you mentioned about sleep and intelligence. So how is uh, intelligence uh, related to sleep? Because I've seen many senior devotees who have been practicing uh, a lot to reduce their sleep time. So how does that affect and uh, can you explain, well, elaborate further on in yeah, intelligence and sleep? Yeah, and you have to reduce your sleep time according to your your strength of your spiritual practice. If you do it ahead of time, then you might find yourself in a situation where the intelligence is not functioning to its capacity. I'll give you an example where how intelligence works in relationship to sleep. And you can, you can also identify with this. Because when sleep is less, or what we say, uh, needed, you can remember the things you need to do, but you can't remember the details. Details become lost when sleep is less. 
you're looking for your car keys, but they're in your hand or they're in your pocket. That's a symptom of being a little sleepy. So we make a shopping list and we write down everything we're going to do when we go shopping, but we forget the list on the table. So forgetfulness appears in small things. So sometimes we see that even senior devotees who are advanced, uh, they may uh, be able to function in Krishna consciousness, but they may forget some of the small things like what is the, how that verse goes, although they know the verse, they forget it. Or, because uh, when intelligence is less, recall becomes less, and then that's usually affected by uh, a lack of sleep, or the mind becomes tired. Like that. So it is not good to um, reduce the sleep time because they are all practicing to reduce it to a minimum. Yeah, it's you, yeah, but not not all at once. It has to be done in proportion to the strength of one's practice. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, it becomes something that's done gradually. The bodies used to come to the Krishna conscious movement and, and all of a sudden try to drastically reduce their sleep. They would be sleeping three or four hours. And then after a while, it became too difficult for them to practice their, to do their service. But you start where you have enough sleep and then gradually you reduce. And that's also adjustable according to the particular daily activities that you're engaged in. But we saw with Srila Prabhupada sometimes, you know, if you read some of the narrations given by his disciples of the experiences they had with him, sometimes people probably would sleep like an hour or two a day. That's all. Still, he would function in the capacity. But we can't, Thank you, Maharaj. We can't imitate that. Thank you, Maharaj. But don't use that as an excuse to sleep more. <laughs> Hare Krishna, yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. How a devotee feels about sleeping, he feels that sleeping is a waste of time. I could be using that time for serving Krishna. Like that. So that, that becomes uh, a feature of wanting to reduce sleep. And that I want to use more time for serving Krishna. Okay, someone else? Yes. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my obeisances. All Guru Shri Prabhupada. Thank you, Maharaj, for the wonderful class. Uh, one question from my side, Maharaj. Krishna has given intelligence to every one of us, but uh, we have uh, different levels of uh, coverings on that, and we are not able to use our intelligence. So, is that because of our past karma or? Uh, how is that happening that everyone has a different level of uh, uh, ability to not use their intelligence? Yeah, like you say, it's due to past karma. That karma also is a feature of the, of the characteristics of your personality. Your personality and your characteristics are symptomized by your previous karma also. So karma works in detail like that. So we have to rightly assume that because of a person's past experiences, their intelligence is not able to be to function within a certain situation. Just like phobias, where do phobias come from? There are people, there's a whole book on phobias where people have different types of phobias, and you'd be surprised how uh, numerous some of the phobias are. But where does it all come from? Past, past lives like that. So, and, and uh, emotions embody certain experiences. So when the experiences, again, come to the forefront, the emotions 
connected with that previous experience also come to the forefront and overshadow the intelligence. Because emotions should be subservient or sublime, subordinate to the intelligence. That's why people who are too emotional, they make a lot of mistakes because they act without intelligence and with emotion. Emotion is attached to karmic, um, karmic results from previous lives or likes and dislikes based on our experiences. Yeah, so then, as you said, it's, it's karmic. But the karmic is that people, some people are more prone to act by and emotions and some are more prone to act by intelligence. And then emotions can also be right when they're guided by intelligence, but if they're not guided by intelligence, then, you know, there's like the emotion of anger. When anger arises and it says intelligence is lost automatically. Thank you, Maharaj. Driving now, huh? Taking Shamagori to the physiotherapy. <laughs> oh, okay. I hope she has some good karma coming. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Sudam. Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my Buddha Vaisanjas. I have a question, uh, Maharaj. Uh, in this, uh, we we are trying to learn to have this uh, service service attitude or servitude spirit, but when it comes to the responsibilities, somehow we how how to uh, understand that even serving uh, family members. Uh, children also is uh, 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 not a burden. So otherwise, we, we are full enthusiastic to serve outside. Yeah, all, all the congregation, extended devotees, temples, and uh, all yatras. But uh, when it comes to, uh, if I, I at least I find sometimes that okay, family. Ah, okay, I wanted to do so many things, but okay, I need to also take care of family. Yeah, if you consider it a burden, then it's going to be like that. If you consider it part of your devotional service to Krishna, that your family members are part and parcel of Krishna, Grihasta Ashram means to cultivate spiritual uh, consciousness within that ashram. So then there's responsibilities. And then one has to take charge of the responsibilities and know how to execute them. If they become a burden, then um, then uh, we we won't be able to uh, do them to the fullest of our capacity. So we have to connect everything with Krishna. That Krishna has given me this situation, and everything belongs to him. So let me serve him in the best way by serving my family members. And, and Maharaj, will, during this process of serving the family members, I think there is no limit. Yeah. So, or is there a limit to understand? Okay. Yes. Now, yeah, I have served uh, sufficiently at home, and now I can start serving also outside. Well, there's a verse that's in that in that relationship with Prabhupada quotes that quite often. Mm -hmm. That in your service to your family is never ended. <laughs> it just keeps going. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have to understand how to do it so it doesn't become the only thing. <laughs> yeah. Just I so would like you, to get this. Hmm? Yeah. So delegating responsibilities to the family members to take charge of different aspects of maintaining the family. The children should not be a, a burden on the family where they. All they do is get everything and don't give anything back. 
Mm. Children should take responsibility even at a young age. Like sometimes I go to people's homes and the kids, the kids just, they just make a mess of the whole place. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would, I would think that if I, these were my kids, I, I would, I would change, <laughs> train them differently. Just to let kids make a mess is not really showing any concern for the kids. They should, you keep your room neat. You keep your stuff neat. You, you know, you, you have to train children from the early to, to become responsible like that. Yep. Thank you. That Thank you very they, much. Man. They don't become a burden. They become actually an asset where they can help in the family in, the, in helping with family responsibilities. It takes a lot of work to train children, but um, in the long run, you'll see that once they grow up in the right way, take on responsibilities. I mean, I used to go to one person's house and this one boy, I mean, he's not, he wasn't a boy. He was like, he's a teenager, late teenager. His room was a total mess. I mean, it was just hell. And so, you know, yeah, we'd always keep the door closed to that room because just by looking at it, it would cause you to, you know, to have the shock. And so sometimes his mother would go in there and straighten everything out. And what he would do, as soon as she would do that, he would take everything and throw it all over the room again. <laughs> and just, he said, this is the way I want it. He would just make a mess. <laughs> so mm. <laughs> what do you do with that? I would tell him either you clean your room or you get your own place. <laughs> <And so. laughs> you can't stay here if you're going to be a... You know, you live like you live in the, the outside. You know? mm -hmm. so we have to be strict with children from the ages of five, from the ages of six to 15, very strict. Because if you don't get strict with children, then they become a big burden to the, to you and to themselves. You know? They have to grow up in the right way. After they're 15 years old, then you become their friend. But that training during those formative years, he calls them the formative years, is important. Mm -hmm. that we, become, we, we have to understand what to teach them and how to teach them. And then if they don't learn, uh, then um, there's some punishment. <laughs> Nowadays, kids rule the family. You know, they do whatever they want. And they tell the parents what they want. The parents have to do it. That's all nonsense. That's growing up in Western societies. They become irresponsible. We have to be really, uh, what we say, careful and strict to make sure children grow up in the, in the right way. Respect for elders, keeping everything clean, taking care of all their needs, and not becoming a burden on the family. I hope I didn't say anything wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Uh, it indeed uh, helped me. Thank you. I see we got uh, lessons. How do we remember Krishna in injustice, in prejudice, in abuse, mental, emotional, and pain? Well, remember Krishna, you call out to Krishna, Krishna, help me to understand what is happening so I can, I can take full shelter of you and, and, and use this situation to become more Krishna conscious or to learn from this situation. Life is a learning experience. We have a chance to learn something every day, or maybe sometimes many things every day. So even pain or reversals in life, parent injustice, as a way of teaching us something that's valuable that we can learn and grow from that. That takes some intelligence. A lot of times, it also requires advice from others. But ultimately, 
um, we want to use whatever situation we are to learn, to grow, to change, and to depend more and more on Krishna. Mostly the features of this world cause difficulties. We just have to uh, see how we can grow from each and every situation in life. And that growing can be changing our view on how, thing, how we see things, or it could be adopting a certain quality that is needed. Or it could be more like just remembering Krishna more and more. Or it could be a combination of all of these things. Each situation is meant to give us some, some uh, lesson in life. <laughs> because the final lesson is death. That's called the final lesson. The final exam, final lesson. And then if we go through the trials of life in the right way, then when we're faced with that time and we have to leave the body, we'll be equipped with the right uh, mentality to move on and go back to the spiritual world. I hope that has some meaning to the question, uh, Pranita asked the question. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. Hare Krishna. Hare Anything else? Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to your holiness. Um, Guru Maharaj, thank you so much for the wonderful class and uh, uh, nice question answer sessions. And I have a question, Guru Maharaj, like um, when intelligent, so do we have to use um, intelligent every time, like instead of, so how should be the surrendering mode towards Krishna uh, when we are using our intelligence? So I, I feel that uh, it will be an abstract, it will be an um, um, obstacle uh, in that uh, uh, surrendering process. Um, can you please explain about that, Guru Maharaj? Well, how to use intelligence to surrender? Yeah, yes Guru, yes, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, that's what it's about. That each situation requires one to use their intelligence on how to best serve in that situation. The most important part of the intelligence is to remind us to, re to, to chant Hare Krishna or to remember Krishna. When the intelligence is active, you can, you can think of Krishna or you can remember Krishna. When the intelligence is not active, you get overwhelmed by circumstances, you forget Krishna. And when you do that, then you may not always act in the best way. As soon as you remember Krishna, especially his lotus feet, then you're always in the best position to act in the best possible way. We should see the situation and remember Krishna at the same time. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, Maharaj, but, uh, but we ask so many questions. Like uh, I feel that we should not ask so many questions like about uh, surrendering towards Krishna. Like, I see, um, instead of using the intelligence in the right way, I, I feel that sometimes I use my intelligence in the wrong way, asking too many questions. Well, that's called over-intelligence or confused intelligence. Uh, Prabhupada used to say, I didn't ask my spiritual master so many questions, but I did ask him one thing, how can I serve you? And then um, 
Prabhupada said, you know, he gave me the instruction to come to the West. And then when I saw him again, after so many years, he gave me the same instruction. So that's the best question. How can I serve? Because that, that attitude of service connects one with the spiritual platform, the spiritual energy, connects one with Krishna. That's the best question. And of course, we're for reading. We can pick up some points that, that need clarifications. We ask questions based on that. Questions and answers are always being asked. It's, it's a feature of life. Even the Bhagavatam explains that. That every people are asking questions and people are giving answers. But then again, there's a lot of useless questions. You have to see what is valuable and what is not. Sometimes we, we see in classes, a person will ask a question that has, you know, it's just, it doesn't have any, any substance to it. It doesn't have any benefit. The answer doesn't benefit anybody, even the questionnaire. So when you ask questions, you have to think, what am I asking and what is, what am, why am I asking this question? What do you think about the question? But it's good to ask questions in general. It's good, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Okay, so I think we can stop here. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll uh, be with you all again next Friday. I see you have a, a very interesting lineup of senior devotees to give classes. So this is wonderful. Uh, uh, prepare your questions and uh, get the answers. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you so much for uh, your education. Now, uh, we will end here. Thank you, everyone, for joining. So, Vancham Kaltar Vishakapa, Sindhu Evcha, Patita Nam Pamne, Vishu, Jon, Monama, Anant Koti Vishamati Kija, Shri, Sapat Kija, Shiva, His Holiness, Chand Mori Maharaj, Kija. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj.